On today's episode, a new timeline for the Starship moon landing, NASA's next step in low Earth orbit, and China's new plan for outer space science. Okay, first things first, we've got new Starship landing footage to look at. This is from a second buoy cam that wasn't shown during the initial live stream of the landing event, and it's able to show us the full landing burn and splashdown of the Starship upper stage on Flight 5 into the Indian Ocean. What's also been revealed over the past week is the reaction from NASA, particularly Administrator Bill Nelson, to the successful landing on Flight 5, and what this means for the Artemis 3 moon landing. Either by coincidence or design, the International Astronautical Conference began on October 14th this year, just one day following the Starship launch, and that put SpaceX at the forefront of pretty much every conversation being had by the global leaders in space exploration, even though SpaceX themselves had a minimal presence at the IAC. The biggest deal is that we got to hear Bill Nelson speak personally about the aftermath of Flight 5. Nelson said during a press conference, quote, I think you saw as a result of Sunday's test of SpaceX and its big rocket that they are moving along very well, and that will determine ultimately the timing for the landing of Artemis 3 on the moon. As of Sunday's test, it was right on the mark. So a pretty loaded statement there. NASA is clearly pretty satisfied with the progress so far on developing Starship, and they are considering this timeline at SpaceX to be the ultimate deciding factor on when people will land on the moon, which Nelson believes is still on the mark. But where is that mark set? He later confirmed they are right on making the benchmarks as they are planning to land in late 2026. I think he's purposely being a bit ambiguous here. It could very well be that NASA still thinks they're landing people on the moon in two years from now, which is cool and all, but I think we all agree that it's just not realistic. Or Nelson is potentially alluding to a new timeline that involves SpaceX completing their first test landing on the moon in two years from now, which is still highly ambitious, but not impossible. Definitely a more realistic goal at this point. Remember that in order to meet their final qualifications, SpaceX must complete an uncrewed test landing on the lunar surface before Starship is cleared for Artemis 3. A NASA assessment published earlier this year put their own confidence in Starship being ready for a crewed moon landing in September 2026 as very low. Instead, they projected a 70% confidence level that Starship will be ready for a lunar landing in February 2028. And what they mean by that is Starship will reach a milestone known as Lunar Orbit Checkout Review, which means that the HLS Starship is in orbit around the moon, ready and waiting to receive crew from the Orion spacecraft. So if we imagine that timeline with what we know today, that gives SpaceX all of 2025 to figure out deploying payload and orbital propellant transfer. Then they have 2026 to develop the first Lunar Starship prototype and deploy that to the moon, which, if successful, would then give them 2027 to incorporate what they learned into the final HLS Starship build and get that vehicle on course for the moon in 2028. Again, this is very ambitious, but not impossible, as long as NASA can hold up their end of the deal with the SLS and Orion system, which at this point continues to be just as big of a question mark. We've got a report from the other day that claims Artemis 2, the crewed flight to lunar orbit, might end up being delayed yet again. A new report from the Government Accountability Office says that work on the SLS mobile launcher and ground systems could prevent Artemis 2 from lifting off in 2025, which is already significantly delayed from its original launch date that should have been scheduled for later this year. Remember that Artemis 1 took off back in November 2022, which was a very successful mission, and in order to make the Artemis launch schedule work, NASA needs to figure out how to launch SLS at least once per year. Now it's looking like they can't even manage a three-year turnaround. NASA has been working on both upgrades and repairs to the ground systems after the Artemis 1 launch, which caused more damage to the mobile launcher than expected requiring repairs as well as the addition of protective barriers to limit damage on future launches. NASA has also installed an emergency escape system at the pad while upgrading software and environmental systems. 
I don't know anything about fixing the launch pads, but it kind of seems like something that should not take three years or more to complete. Anyway, not only is the American space program currently enthralled in their potential return to the moon, they've also been spending a lot of time thinking about the future of science in low Earth orbit. For over two decades, the International Space Station has been our laboratory in the sky, revolutionizing scientific research and space exploration. But with the ISS set to retire, what comes next? NASA recently released their Low Earth Orbit Microgravity Strategy, which is designed to ensure that the human presence in space doesn't end when the ISS retires. However, NASA is rethinking what it means to have a continuous human presence in low Earth orbit. Speaking at the International Astronautical Conference, NASA's Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy recently addressed a key question. Does there always need to be astronauts in space? Science remains at the heart of NASA's mission. The microgravity environment in low Earth orbit allows for research that simply can't be done on Earth. NASA will continue to focus on biological and physical sciences, studying how space impacts living organisms, materials, and technologies. But it's not just about science. Low Earth orbit is also a proving ground for technologies that will take us further into space. From autonomous systems to life support innovations, these advancements are crucial as NASA looks to the Moon and Mars. However, as Melroy highlighted, Keeping a continuous heartbeat, the idea of always having astronauts in orbit, might not be practical during the transition from the ISS to commercial stations. Instead, NASA is considering a continuous capability, where astronauts are sent into orbit when needed without maintaining a constant human presence. This flexible approach could provide more options as commercial space stations become operational, especially in the early stages when resources will be limited. Melroy also mentioned that commercial space stations could begin as crew tended, with astronauts visiting periodically before evolving into stations that could support continuous human crews as their business models and capabilities continue to grow. Looking ahead, NASA won't be the only player in low Earth orbit. Private companies will take a leading role, building and operating their own space stations. NASA's role will shift to being a customer, purchasing services from these commercial platforms to ensure that they continue to support scientific research, human habitation, and innovation. This vision ties directly into NASA's Commercial LEO Development Program, or CLD. The next phase of this program is set to launch in 2025 and will fund companies to certify their space stations for NASA astronauts and allow NASA to purchase services on these platforms. Awards are expected in 2026, with the number of companies selected depending on the available budgets and the quality of the proposals. NASA's partnerships go beyond the commercial sector. International cooperation has long been a cornerstone of space exploration, and NASA aims to continue working with other nations to keep space a collaborative frontier. Moreover, human operations in LEO will ensure the skills and knowledge developed on the ISS remain sharp for future deep space missions. However, the transition from the ISS to commercial stations comes with a lot of challenges. At Congress, NASA officials underscored the importance of avoiding a gap in human presence, not only for scientific continuity, but also to maintain the US leadership in space. The ISS is expected to retire around 2030, and its deorbiting will be handled by the US deorbit vehicle, which will only be operational for a limited time of 1.5 years. NASA's goal is to have the first commercial stations in place before the ISS is retired, ensuring continuous capability in space. As Pam Melroy put it, there is no way we should launch something that has a ticking clock until you have another capability that you're sure of. So before the ISS is deorbited, two conditions must be met, having a functional commercial space station and deploying the deorbit vehicle. The commercial sector is ready to play a major role in the future of low Earth orbit. NASA envisions commercial space stations not only as a way to maintain human presence in space, but also as a driver of economic growth and innovation across industries like healthcare, energy, and agriculture. By being the anchor tenant, NASA hopes that it will help to spark this transition. All of NASA's work in low Earth orbit is part of a broader vision, preparing humanity for deep space exploration. The lessons learned in LEO will help establish sustainable operations on the moon, 
and eventually enable missions to Mars. Whether testing life support systems or simulating mission operations, low Earth orbit remains the training ground for NASA's most ambitious missions. And not to be left out, the Chinese are taking a rare opportunity to speak freely about their upcoming plans for scientific discovery beyond the Earth. China has just unveiled an ambitious roadmap for space science that extends through to the year 2050. Released by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, China National Space Administration, and the China Manned Space Agency, this national medium and long-term development plan for space science outlines a comprehensive strategy, setting the stage for decades of space research. The overall plan revolves around five key scientific themes. Each is designed to tackle some of the most fundamental questions about our universe. The extreme universe theme aims to unlock the mysteries of the universe's origin and evolution. It focuses on studying dark matter, extreme cosmic events, and detecting baryonic matter, all to understand the universe in ways never done before. Next, the space-time ripples theme targets the detection of gravitational waves, both low frequency and primordial, as means of unraveling the nature of gravity and the fabric of space-time itself. This is a key area where China hopes to achieve breakthroughs with space-based gravitational wave detection. The third theme, the panorama of the Earth and Sun, seeks to explore the complex interactions between the Earth, the Sun, and the wider solar system. Through deep study of space weather, the Earth-Moon system, and heliosphere exploration, China aims to understand the dynamic forces that shape our cosmic neighborhood. The Habitable Planets theme focuses on investigating the potential for life beyond Earth. China will study the habitability of celestial bodies within our solar system and search for exoplanets with the ultimate goal of uncovering extraterrestrial life. Finally, the Biological and Physical Sciences in Space theme will delve into how life and matter behave under space conditions. By studying microgravity, quantum mechanics, and general relativity, China hopes to deepen its understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe. The development roadmap for these themes is divided into three phases. The first phase, from now until 2027, focuses on maintaining the operation of the Tiangong space station and carrying out manned lunar missions. This period also includes the fourth phase of the Chang'e Lunar Exploration Project and the approval of five to eight space science satellite missions. In the second phase, from 2028 to 2035, China will build the International Lunar Research Station on the Moon and expand Tiangong Space Station to double its current size. During this phase, the nation plans to deploy about 15 space satellite missions and continue crewed lunar landings. Finally, the third phase from 2036 to 2050 will see the launch of more than 30 space science missions with the goal of making significant advancements in key areas that will place China at the forefront of global space research. Through this ambitious plan, China seeks to tackle some of the biggest scientific mysteries, dark matter, the origins of the universe, and extraterrestrial life signaling a clear bid to rival NASA and other space agencies. And this raises interesting questions. Can China deliver on these promises, or will it face the same hurdles that have challenged other space programs in the past?